Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Hi, I'm Gabe Lyons, and welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast. And today, you're going to get to hear two talks that are from two different leaders nationally engaging this incredibly heated topic, which is whether churches should open or whether they should stay shut. Now, I know you probably have your opinion on this, as does probably every American and every church-going person, but what we wanted to do at Q, which is what we try to do with every topic and conversation, is give you the best exposure to how people are thinking about difficult issues. And this cultural conversation around biblical convictions and government restrictions was one that we wanted to bring to bear with our community on Q Media, and it was an event called Church and State. And so what we've done for this podcast is put together these two very different opinions opposed to one another, essentially. The first is from John MacArthur. He's the pastor and teacher of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. You may have heard of him. He's over 80 years old. He's somebody that during this COVID moment has really rejected the way Governor Newsom in California has asked their church to participate uh, by basically distancing, not meeting, and the list goes on and on. And instead, he just believes in his conviction that the church should meet, and we aren't to abide by these guidelines anymore. They're unhelpful. And so I'm going to ask him about that and ask him where that's rooted in Scripture, how he sees it, how he's thinking about this pandemic. I think you'll be really interested to hear what he has to say. And after we hear from John MacArthur, we're then going to hear from Andy Stanley. He's the pastor of North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia, with multiple campuses. And you may have heard he's decided they're not going to have any in-person services until the new year. And so he presents his case for why he believes that's the right decision for a church to make in his particular situation. So let's listen to both of these talks, and I want you to see what you think and why you think it. Welcome, Dr. MacArthur. Thank you for being with us today. This is such an important conversation, and I would love to just jump in with you explaining to us your theological view on the distinct roles of the government institution and the church institution, uh, and when should they overlap, and when should they be protected from one another? Well, it's crystal clear that God has ordained government. I mean, that's a uh, Romans 13 issue that uh, the powers that be are ordained of God. It doesn't mean every single person in a political position or a position of ruling is an, a servant of God in this in the real sense of proclaiming God's truth. But government as an entity is God designed so that humanity can flourish for God's redemptive purposes and for his glory. So um, government is ordained by God. It's defined in fulfilling its God ordained responsibility as protecting those who do good and being a terror to those who do evil. So as long as the government functions in that way, it's fulfilling its God-ordained role. On the other hand, the church is a completely different entity. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He has a kingdom over which he is Lord. Jesus is the head of the church. In fact, Paul said in, in uh, his definition of headship in the book of Ephesians that he who is over all things was given as head to the church. So the head of the church is the Lord over everything. So he's the Lord over governments. He's the Lord over the church. So the only time that you have a conflict is when the government invades the lordship of Christ. When the government tells the church what to do or what not to do, tells Christians what they can do or cannot do, then it has extended itself beyond its bounds. And that's when we have to submit to the Lord of the church. That becomes clear in the book of Acts, chapter 4 and 5, where, you know, the, the apostles were told not to preach, stop preaching. And they said, you know, you need to judge wh whether we should do what God says or what you say. And then it led them to finally say, we, we will obey God, not man. 
So it, it only comes into conflict when the government oversteps its bounds. Yeah, and it seems like in part of your church's response and the way that you're, you're leading uh, is that you did s- stop doing church services for a season, but then you felt like there was an overreach and it was overburdensome and that you should no longer continue in that. Is part of it because this pandemic, as you see it, really isn't the threat that it's been uh, stated to be. And so, therefore, your meetings can take place without social distancing, without masks, because you're not really seeing the threat as as big of a deal as others have said it is. Yeah, exactly, Gabe. Uh, at the beginning, we, we heard millions are going to die. Well, anybody with the, any common sense is going to say, we don't want to be responsible for millions of people dying. So we did live stream, and we, we went on doing that for four weeks until we were trying to figure out the realities. And then just a kind of in an, uh, just a personal uh, transition, people started coming to church. They knew we were doing live stream. They knew the auditorium was empty. They just started coming in and more every week, every week, every week. And they did that because every week it became more clear that millions were not going to die. And uh, at the point that I finally said, you know, we need to be here. California had hit 99.99% of the population will not die from COVID. It's 0.01%. And we heard the other day that there is one death from COVID per 100,000 people in California at this present time. So the the narrative doesn't work. They, They can't sell us this lie anymore that makes you shut down the church. We have about 7,000 people at church the last couple of weeks. We don't know of anybody sick. We've never had anybody in the hospital with COVID. So in your view, as you're thinking about the other pastors and leaders that might be watching this today and trying to assess for themselves, should they disobey as well? Should they be exercising civil disobedience? Would you say part of that decision and discussion for that group of elders or the team that's making that decision is to really form an opinion about this pandemic in particular and whether the realities of meeting is going to really further the problem or whether it should be able to take place uh, regardless. Um, and, and, and I guess if you were to say, yes, that's what they should be doing, uh, do you see any challenge to trying to put church leaders in the place where they're trying to discern science and epidemiology and public health information, especially if it might be at odds with what they're being told from their local government? I think everybody knows the truth. Uh, Try to find somebody who knows somebody with COVID who's in the hospital. Try to find somebody who knows somebody that died of COVID who wasn't having comorbidities in in an old age home or something like that where 98% of the people are who are affected by this. So I think we all see the reality of it. You know, it doesn't take an army to conquer a nation. It just takes fear. And even if that fear is deceptive, it's amazing how through the centuries people will fight for freedom and give it up to protect, to be protected from the flu. How many thousands of men gave their lives for the freedoms in America? And people are rolling over on the flu. So part of preaching the word in season and out of season, as Paul says, is looking at the seasons, looking at the epics, looking at your times. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you you can tell the weather, but you have no idea what time it is in God's redemptive history. Being a pastor means you're a truth teller. That means you're a truth teller when it comes to the Bible. And that means you protect your people from deception that comes from the world. That's part of being a shepherd. Um, you don't want to aid and abet the lie. And, and this is a lie, and we can't necessarily say that everybody is involved in it has an ulterior motive, but the lie is dominating. You need to be a truth teller, and you need to do your homework, and there's plenty of information available. So, yeah, I would say to pastors, have church. Open up. Have church. You don't have to fear somebody's going to die. You don't have to fear you're going to get sued because they're not going to be able to trace, the, you know, this back to make. I haven't seen anything like that happen anywhere. The L.A. Police Department sent out a memo to all their officers and said, don't do anything against Grace Church. That's when the city sued us. They said, we will not act against Grace Church. So the politicians have separated themselves even from the enforcement people. It doesn't help to be defunding the police. That's not going to gain you any ground with them. But the police know this is not law-breaking. They uphold the law. This is not law. Health, health mandates and governor's orders are not law. So I don't think you have to fear that. Uh, I think uh, you need to open the church because this of all times when people fear is where they need to come and hear the truth. And I don't think you have to give a clinical explanation. 
I think you just have to welcome them and not make them follow protocol that you know is is pointless. So in your view, pastors and churches who are not willing to do that or to gather in some ways might be abdicating their spiritual leadership with their congregations and not guiding them through this season, right? Yeah, here's the deal. You're a truth teller. I mean, our stock and trade is you come and the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, right? You're going to hear the truth here. Come here and hear the truth. If I've got social distancing and lockdown and one person out of 100,000 is dying in California, my people are going to think that I bought into the lie. I can't aid and abet that deception. So truth would tell you start church, have church. The Constitution, by the way, is on your side. Whoever disallows you to have church without a real emergency is in violation of the Constitution. So you're not the lawbreaker. Whoever made those mandates that restricted your free exercise of religion, they're the lawbreakers. So just a final question, but as you think about this from an ecclesiological perspective and how the church operates, um, what, what in your view is the importance of these larger gatherings? Because certainly a lot of churches are able to still meet maybe outside. They're meeting in smaller groups. I know in California, there's been a burden of not even having smaller groups in homes meet. But in a lot of other states throughout America, people are able to gather in smaller spaces. What to you is so important about this larger moment that takes place at least once on a weekly basis? Well, I, I think corporate worship is uh, the, the stimulating of one another to love and good works as we come together. Even the early church came together. They didn't have their own building, so they went to the temple collectively. All of them were there. There were thousands of them there. There were 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. And a couple of chapters later, there were at least 20,000 believers roaring into the, the temple uh, to, to worship the Lord. And I think that's, that corporate testimony is profound. But beyond that, how do you stimulate one another to love and good works if you're isolated from each other? I mean, we come together for the purpose of corporate worship. One other thing to say is this. To be really honest, if, if all church is is a kind of a high-tech TED Talk, then you can't pull it off uh, with any kind of limitations. I can see why you shut it down. If church is an adult kind of event, you know, maybe you can take it outside and follow the rules. But if church is really church, and you've got a nursery, and you've got a thousand children as we do in classes four and a half hours on a Sunday learning the Word of God, learning sound doctrine, and you've got you know got a thousand university students there in high school and junior high and adult fellowship groups, this is their life. This is a real church with real relationships, and all their most intense relationships are in that life of the church. Uh, so not having the church. Sending people home and saying, watch live stream or have a home Bible study doesn't really meet their needs. And if you want proof of that, when we said, come to church, the following Sunday, 6,000 people showed up at church. They could have stayed home. They, they, got, they couldn't get there fast enough. And last Sunday, we opened it to the children. We had 1,000 children. We passed out balloons and lollipops. And it was an incredible explosion of joy because they're made for relationships. Yeah, well, Dr. MacArthur, I appreciate you being a part of this with us, helping pastors think about it and a better understand uh, behind the scenes, really, behind the headlines of how you're thinking about this theologically and how you're hoping other churches will perceive this moment. So thank you for joining us. We're going to turn our attention now to Atlanta, Georgia, and Andy Stanley. He founded North Point Ministries in 1995. They have seven churches in the Atlanta area, but there's a hundred located all over the world who are part of this community serving over 185,000 people. Andy is known for his leadership wisdom and helping people think through things, not only as a pastor, but also what does it mean to think through this as a part of the community, as a leader? And he has a very different perspective than Dr. John MacArthur. And so I want to welcome Andy Stanley. Andy, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'd love for you to just start out by sharing with us kind of the core reason why you've decided to close your church building until January or till later notice. Yeah, well, first, uh, we have not closed our church buildings. We have suspended our Sunday morning worship services, um, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing um, for the rest of the year. So the only thing we're not doing is gathering, you know, hundreds, actually thousands of people in our buildings. 
for now from now to the end of the year and just a little context like everybody else you know back in the spring we shut down or we announced we were going to be closing services for three weeks you know then that went to three months and then as we got closer to august when we thought we would reopen then we announced that we would uh, suspend services for the rest of the year and you know kind of the bottom line based on what's happening in the atlanta area and there are areas where our churches are located around atlanta um this was this was just our way of loving our neighbors and loving our neighborhoods and trying to keep our neighborhoods safe. Um, as we got closer to school reopening and reopening schools around here, which is the case in most of the parts of the country, but for us, opening schools became very complicated. And we realized the last thing our communities need was another, another potential super spreader environment where you're bringing, again, hundreds or thousands of people together. And the schools are having a difficult enough time opening and staying open, even the university systems, as you know. So this just seemed like the wisest thing to do as it related to uh, the community, Um, you know, and as we wait this thing out to figure out what's going to happen. But there, like so many churches, we've made lots of adjustments and there's there are a lot of things going on. We're still doing weddings, funerals, gatherings, driveway gatherings, Um, mornings when I drive into the office. There are small groups in our parking lots. We're doing outdoor worship. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of new, innovative activity. We're just not gathering on Sunday morning, you know, in our traditional way. And you, Gabe, you've been a part of our church. Our student ministries are so large. Our middle school ministry could become a super spreader environment. So it's not just adult worship. It's all those ancillary things that require hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. So yeah, that's kind you, of the uh, and, short and story. I, I know you mentioned, I mean, you felt like one of the responsibilities of opening your church meant to really work with the public health department was being able to contact trace, being able to alert people if they actually had come into contact with somebody with the virus and that just practically that was going to be kind of an impossibility. Well, you know what? We've had so many staff members get sick. Contact tracing just after we opened the offices has been such a problem that we've backed off even on our office hours. We've had so many, again, so many family members. And just to, you know, I I know there's so much controversy around this, and we'll get to that in a minute. But to just put it in perspective, I'm not going to tell a lot of stories. I eat up all of our time. But a week and a half ago, we had a drive through memorial service for a high school senior to help him um, remember his parents. Both of his parents died four days apart from COVID. They were both in their late and one in their mid fifties. Dad went in the hospital, put on a ventilator. All three of them had it. So here's this high school senior, only child, drives through the parking lot, hundreds and hundreds of people from the church and the community with candles. He's COVID positive. He can't even get out of his car and be comforted. He has to drive back home to his, <laughs> till he living by himself. Now he's going to go live with his grandmother. You know, the church communities come around him. So, um, you know, these aren't stories we read about for us, at least. And I know, I know this isn't the case for every church. These are staff members, friends, um, yeah. you know, people we're grieving with and suffering with. So it's, it's very close to home for us. Yeah, you've made the case, too, that the church is not here to win, but to serve, to care for others, even if it costs us something. And I'm, I'm curious, for churches that are opening, though, and we're talking to several of those throughout this time who are opening, who feel convicted that they need to be open, that their doors must be open. I mean, do you think or see that as something that they're doing that might be wrong? That's, that's something they're doing maybe out of political motivation versus biblical conviction? Um. I do not think this is a one-size-fits-all um, decision. In fact, you know Sean C., who's the pastor of our church in Athens, Athens, a college town. Well, uh, two months ago, um, Athens Church decided to reopen. They're part of our network of churches, about two hours outside of Atlanta. Um, but the situation there in that community is very different, especially Buckhead, downtown Atlanta, you know, uh, you know the city of Atlanta. Um, but at the same time, Athens is a college town. So now the university is trying to figure out how to open. (laughs) And it could be that, you know, Sean reverses courses, of course, but he's a great leader. So I do not think this is one size fits all. I would never judge another leader's motives. But I would say, please take into consideration your testimony and your influence in the community because no one should ever give up influence unnecessarily. And I just have encouraged pastors, look, I, I know you want to take care of your people, and you should. You should shepherd your people. But we all know there are other ways to do that. So, um, But I do not think 
this is one size fits all. This is just our decision based on what's happening in the Atlanta area. Yeah, and I know there's several churches that would say by not being open in a typical rhythm, the Sunday service rhythm, there's all kinds of other habits that form back into people's lives. There's ways in which that that there are mental health issues. There's a lot of other outcomes that start to happen when our lives aren't back in rhythm. But your point would be there's other ways to stay in rhythm outside of the Sunday service and your church is doing that. You, you did mention too that, you know, you, you want to be careful about the message that sends to the community. In some ways, uh, you know, a view of, of making sure our neighbors actually perceive the church as being helpful. Um, and so I, I think that's a an important point to just recognize, are we being good neighbors in this time? And I think that's been the argument kind of back and forth is, is being a good neighbor actually opening because your people need it or is being a good neighbor closing? Are you, are you suggesting because of your particular area, the way you're looking at the public health of your particular zone, that to be a good neighbor means we can't gather large groups in a way that could be unsafe. But in some circumstances, society and cultures and communities may be able to do that. Was there a question in there? Yeah. Are, are, you, suge- are you suggesting that um, it's okay in some cases to gather if you're able to do it in a safe way and you don't feel like it's going to impact the community? So some churches should keep their doors open for the remainder of the year if they've put it through a grid like that. Well, I mean, most of the churches around us have opened. Um, they're doing social distancing. They're wearing masks. Um, the other thing, and Gabe, you can appreciate this, and this is, again, you know, I— I'm putting on my leadership hat. I have 500 plus staff members in our Atlanta area churches who are amazing people who want to do things. What they don't want to do and what I don't want them to do is to sit around and kind of wait and wait and wait and maybe in a week and maybe in a month, you know, maybe in three months. So I, so, you know, when we shut down our services, I said, look, we're going to redeploy our efforts. Let's do things now we've not had time to do in the past. Let's do a full court press in our communities. And now that schools are reopening, let's see if we can use our buildings um, to help facilitate some of the complexities of reopening. So um, let's get busy. Let's be innovative. Now you have more time. And, um, you know, our giving is down some, but our, our expenses are also down. So let's take that margin and re-engage it and redeploy it. And so we're learning all kinds of things. And, and to your point, we're gathering uh, this at just at North Point Community Church um, this past weekend. We had worship on the lawn. We had about 3,000 people there. But we have five acres of grass, <laughs> so we we uh, we put circles all over the grass, and you signed up for a circle, and you and your family got a circle, all separated. So yeah. we had an incredible night of worship. We did communion. So we're still looking for ways to gather people, because you're right, um, you know, uh, social distancing and isolation isn't good for anyone. Even the people who enjoy it, it's not good for them. And I'm an introvert. I enjoy it, but it, that's not good for me. So there, there are ways to work around that. And having given our staff permission, don't folk, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen seven days from now. You know, you know the church world. Here comes Sunday. Here comes Sunday. It's exhausting. So, um, you know, we're just doing other things. Yeah, and curious, and just final question here. In American culture, of course, this right to assemble and worship is something celebrated by a lot of pastors and, and don't want to give that up. And they see this threat coming at a government level in certain states. I know Georgia is a little different, and you have said you didn't do this based on government restricting. This has just been common sense for you in the way in which you want to approach leading your church. Um, But could you see a point, I mean, if you were a church in California, for example, like we just talked with John MacArthur, where the government actually says you can't meet in groups of over 10 in your home, and, and there starts to be these lines crossed where the government's really pushing in. Um, do you see there being some lines that church leaders and pastors like yourself, there is a point where you push back in American life to say this is too far? Well, I don't think that's an inappropriate question. What I think is we would both have to contextualize that question for more time than we have. And in light of what's happening now, there's no reason to push back because I think every evidence is our our state and local and federal government is trying to figure out a really big problem. And as 
Christians should cooperate as much as possible, and they're not going to get it right. Nobody's trying to shut down the church in America unless we think that there's a connection between SEC football, the NFL, the NBA, um, and everything else has been shut down. And I can't speak to what's going on in California. I'm like everybody else. I just read the news. I just that any local municipality is picking on the local church. They're trying to solve a big problem, and church gatherings are one of many gatherings that ha- have had to be addressed. So um, I think half the NFL teams just voted, or 13 of the NFL teams just voted, uh, just voted we're not going to put st- uh, fans in the stand. Well, that's a good decision for the community, even though it's not good for the NFL. And so as church leaders, um, you know, again, Area by area, I think we have to make those same kinds of decisions with what's best for the community in mind. So I can't imagine a scenario in the United States of America um, where the only group that's being picked on is the church, unless it's a specific local church. But um, you know this, Gabe. Every local church has has to operate within certain guidelines given by the government. If you've ever tried to get a land disturbance permit, any of us who've built lots of buildings, you know, bathroom restrictions, um, there's all kind of fire code, building code. So it's okay for the government to speak into when we meet noise ordinances. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. So government has put some parameters around how we meet, when we meet, how we get on and off our property. So none of that is new. And in most cases, those codes and restrictions are actually good for the community and good for the local church once you finally get your building built. So um, yeah, that's, I, that's great. I just don't think what's happening in our country is as onerous, maybe as um, it's being spoken of in, in some areas. So yeah. that's just my opinion. Yeah, Andy, well, I really appreciate you being frank with us and helping us better understand how you're thinking through this. I know so many pastors in American life do respect how you lead and how you think about this from a leadership perspective. So thank you for being with us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Gabe. Well, I told you, you were going to get two very different opinions. And I hope as you listen to all that, you could here, kind of behind the decisions, what are they thinking? Why? What is it based on? And and our goal to stay curious and think well. There's valid points in both of these men's arguments and how they're approaching it. They're both also in very different context. Uh, throughout our church and state discussion and event, we had ten different talks. We heard from legal scholars, constitutional attorneys, historians, and also other pastors who are in different contexts and thinking about this. And in doing so, you're able to get this full picture. You're getting a full picture, a holistic view of how complex this conversation is. But what you'll find is that both of these men, while very convicted about their approaches, they both feel like they're doing the right thing. And I think the important thing we can take away from this is given the situation you're in, what is going to be your rudder? How are you going to make the decision if you're asked to do something that either goes against your conviction or in some ways goes against maybe the way your people feel you should be leading. It can put you in a challenging position, but when you root that in conviction, that gives you a steady place to stand. If you want to hear more about these talks and you want to watch them, I invite you to enjoy these talks. Listen to this full two-hour event where I interview 10 different people. You can watch back these two conversations with your friends, maybe with other leaders that you're doing ministry with or thinking about these kinds of issues with your institution, and you can do that at QIdeas dot org slash state. And when you go there, you can see all the different presenters, the topics that we addressed, as well as you can go actually get a subscription to Q Media if you don't already have it. If you do have it, then that's available to you now. You can just enjoy watching these talks and having good conversations about how to lead in our current moment.